And joining us now to talk some science, Merdad Hariri. He is the chair of the 2009 Canadian Science Policy Conference, which is starting in a couple of days in Toronto. And first, as I welcome you here to our studios, one of the reasons we wanted you in that chair is that we've just had a week in Waterloo at the Q2C, the Quantum to Cosmos Festival. Spent a week on science-related subjects on this program, and now we are kind of, I guess, bookending it uh, with your presentation here tonight. And I want to start by talking money because science and money are inextricably linked, as we all know. Last February's budget, what did the scientific community think of it? Uh, well, I would say the most scientists were kind of angry and fury was about the allocation of the fund. On one hand, this is the sci scientific community's reaction, uh, which they were angry. They thought that it was not properly allocated to the various sectors of scientific community. And on the other hand, there is a government who claims this was a record spending in science and technology. And I would say the both hand were correct. They were right they in their claims. Right. Absolutely. So that there actually was a record amount of money that went out. Yes. But not to the things that the community would have preferred. Is that right? That is correct. So this is something that we call is a lack of or a weak proper channels of communication and consultation. This was one of the ideas that uh, was our concerns to basically initiate this conference at the beginning. What did scientists want the money to go towards that they felt it did not go towards? So the big chunk of that money went to the infrastructure and uh, the scientific community thought the biggest amount should have gone to the operational research. So we had these uh, uh, allocation of the fund, the biggest part to the infrastructure and basically the operational research uh, met some cut in funding. Basically, 5% of the funding for uh, granting uh, agencies was cut. So that was something that they were furious about. And uh, I must say that the money for operational research is like with uh, blood in the whistles, basically. It's that important. I see. Here's what the minister had to say back in February, as quoted <coughs> in the National Post. He said, this is Gary Goodyear, our government is committed, he said, to basic discovery-oriented research. Compared to other nations, Canada is extremely good at supporting university-based research. We invest more in higher education research and development than any other country in the group of seven as a proportion of GDP. We are second only to Sweden in the OECD and well ahead of the United States, which ranks 17th. Is he right? Absolutely. He is this right. is correct. Yes, because the uh, m money toward the uh, R&D is coming from various sources and spending in various uh, sectors. So with respect to government spending in higher education and universities, yes, Canada is the second in OECD to Sweden, basically. So we are doing pretty well in that respect. What, when it comes what we are poor at, when it comes to the government spending, uh, uh, government spending in R&D and uh, business spending in R&D, we rank 12, I believe, in government spending in research and development and 15 uh, in business spending expenditure in R&D, B-E-R-D, basically what it's called. And we are well below the average of OECD countries. Hmm. In which case, how, what advice would you give to governments to create a stronger, more collaborative research culture in this country? Well, if I knew the answer, actually, I would have uh, run for an office problem. <laughs> I don't know the answer. But this conference that we are uh, organizing, this is uh, help to find some of the answers by bringing various stakeholders on board to discuss the issues and come up with some solutions. And there is no easy answer, uh, Steve, to this question. We need, uh, the, because this is a multifactorial issue. Uh, it relates to the government, policymakers, scientific community itself, and definitely industry, and overall our uh, basically position in the international community, uh, what kind of country we want in future. So there are various factors into this and definitely various stakeholders should come on board and discuss the issues in a systematic, continuous way to help to improve the situation. Well, let me quote here from someone who weighed in back in the spring. We did a program about uh, science and science funding in the spring. And here's a clip of Andrew Weaver, who was on that program, the right. uh, Canada Research Chair from the University of Victoria. Here's what he had to say. Roll sure. tape, please. Unfortunately, to add on top of to what has been said, though, is we have a we have a system in Canada which, which has worked very well for a long time, but now in these times of restraint, we're adding, a, 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 the perfect storm was described, we've got another kind of twist to it, is that uh, like never before, we have a government that's stepping in and deciding what research is of the prior, top priority for Canadians. So, so we've got an addition to that perfect storm is less money available, but also a government that thinks it knows what the priorities for Canada are, whether and, it, and it's doing that without consultation with the broader community through a normal peer review type system. 
Do you agree that science funding in this country has become too politicized? Uh, yes and no. Yes, it has been politicized to some extent. And I think this is the most dangerous thing that happened to our scientific community. What we need, as I said, is a national conversation on uh, proper policies on science and innovation, bringing everybody on board. That's what we need, regardless of the ideology, regardless who is in government. Okay, what is that? A national conversation means what? How do, what is that? There you go. We, we, <laughs> this is what uh, actually I was ready to answer. So science policy in Canada is weak. It's under attended. It's not related to the mainstream uh, Canadian society and and uh, it lacks a uh, few institutions uh, infrastructure uh, first we need some organizations for proper consultation as advisory body to the government and that has to be as I said uh, with the participation of uh, the broad range of scientific community and systematic consultation with the government. This is one of the things that we need. Okay, let me take a flyer here. Sure. Most members of the media, most members of the political class of this country are scientific illiterates, which I'm guessing doesn't help, right? Uh, you're absolutely right, and it's not just media, it's, it's, it's the government as well. How many scientists and how much interaction there is between the Parliament Hill and political body and scientific community. This is something that we are missing in Canada. Uh, um, in contrast, the U.S. does enjoy a very systematic and continuous interaction between the politicians <clears throat> and scientific machinery. Okay, let me quote once again from Gary Goodyear, who mm -hmm. was the, uh, who is the minister. This is again back in February around budget time. Where Canada lags behind other countries, however, is in the area of commercialization, getting innovations from the lab <coughs> to the marketplace, where Canadians and people around the world can benefit from our newest discoveries. Generally speaking, uh, I wonder, are discoveries made in the public sector used to their full potential in private industry? This is correct, actually. This is our disadvantage in Canada, and this is one of the things, one of the main issues that we need to address and improve the situation in our country, and that's the lack of uh, basically transferring technology from university to business. This is absolutely true. Another part of your question with uh, respect to the international community is a much uh, broader question. Mm -hmm. And I think this is again one of the things that we have to improve with respect to international collaboration in scientific and technology. Uh, Steve, imagine that 97% of innovation and new technologies are not Canadian. So if we want to be a leader to be uh, uh, in, as a knowledge-based economy, okay, we have to have a very interconnected relation with the international community when it comes to science and technology. Did I hear that number right? 97% of innovations and new technologies are not Canadian. That is correct. So we've got 3% of the action right now. Yes. What should it be? Uh, I think the percentage wise is, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know what percentage should be, but percentage wise represent to our population as well maybe, in a way. However, our capacities are much greater than that. We can do better than that. There is no question about it. Well, I wonder again, you talked about R&D a, a few moments ago. Uh, we do have an historically low, particularly in the private sector, uh, research and development reinvestment uh, attitude. Why do you think that is? Uh, well, well, I think there are various factors. It, it's a culture of uh, feeling complacency. complacency and, and uh, feeling that the status quo is okay. And scientific community usually tend to be quiet and looking at their benchmark, bench work, and doing uh, their own research. However, the time has passed that every scientist should have only focus on their bench work. So the time is, uh, the, the, the 21st century actually, is a century of communication, interconnection, and is much more complex. What are the things that our scientific community is lacking in science advocacy machinery? We do not have a proper one in Canada. Uh, our scientific associations is ge are generally weak, uh, fragmented, and their efforts are not in a coordinated manner. So that's something that has to be changed. And our industry is not aggressive enough into discovering new markets, so they are based mostly on our natural resources. Mm -hmm. So 65% of our exports are either raw or lightly processed material, Steve. So this is probably, this number probably is some answer to that question. Okay, let me do a follow up on the industry angle here. Um, are you concerned that more industry involvement means more scientists tailoring their research 
to jive with corporate interests rather than perhaps the public interest? Uh, but the public interest research and discovery is there and it should be there. For every innovation, there must be huge investment in basic science. However, when we talk about the interaction, meaning using the very updated scientific knowledge in order to upgrade or discover new technologies. And I think this is full-fledged in the public interest as well. Okay. On the forum that you've got coming up in Toronto later this week, uh, there's been some chat already on your website, and I want to read one of the... Um, here's an excerpt from one of the discussion boards related right. to the conference. There is, the author says, an inherent bias within graduate programs that expects grad students to go on to academic or other research careers, partly due to the outlook of some research professors who view research as the highest goal with other careers being left for those who can't make it in research. However, even in an academic research career, there are many skills that the research lab and traditional subject-based courses don't prepare you for. Public speaking and management of people and budgets, just to name a few. Focusing on a few skills like this would benefit the student whether they go to academic research, industry, management, or science policy. Daniel Banks wrote that. Is he right? Absolutely. He is yes. Right. You're agreeing with everything tonight. That's so funny. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think you have done proper research before and see if okay. Well, how much of a problem... And prob I'm on your show, by the way. I well, to... <laughs> thank you for saying so. But how much of a problem do you think is bias in the scientific research community against working in the private sector? I don't think there is a bias, but traditionally, uh, working in academic environment is considered more prestigious. Is it right or not? I don't think it's right, but this is a view traditionally. It's not just in Canada, it's everywhere in the world that university has the highest prestige among the academician. So this, is the, this has been the tradition and reality. However, it does not mean that the scientists who are working in industry uh, um, I mean, suffer from lack of knowledge. Absolutely not true. Okay, but you think, uh, uh, these are stereotypes admittedly, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but you tend to think of the university community as being a bit ivory tower, Science as well, a bit removed from the public. We don't necessarily understand all of what you do or maybe any of what you do. If you put those two things together, I think this is a legitimate question. Do scientists care about whether or not the public supports what they're doing? Uh, very good question. And this is something that we think as probably a newer generation of scientists have to be changed. So scientists with that advocacy machine that I mentioned, uh, but, but they have to have a very strong public relation in order to engage public into their scientific research. We need a new generation of scientists who understand how to integrate their research into broader societal context. And, and, and can sell it to the public. Absolutely, absolutely. In which case, I happen to have some video that I want to play for you right now. Sure. Look at that monitor right there, and please roll tape. We're not rock stars. Or movie stars. We're just scientists. Scientists in white coats and nerdy sweaters. So why would you care what we have to say? Because right now, there's a way to cure disease. Regenerate organs. Prevent heart attacks. Let bodies heal themselves. Defeat diabetes. Parkinson's. MS. And more. Become less dependent on drugs. Stop wars and car crashes from crippling us. Make growing old truly graceful. And provide unprecedented hope for humanity. It's called a stem cell. A smart cell. And it can do all that. Not in 100 years or 50. But in 10. The Stem Cell Foundation put that up on YouTube, and it's had a lot of hits. And does that help? I think it helps. I had not seen this before, but I think this is one of the aspects to engage public into what you do as a researcher. Absolutely. They said 10 years on that, not 50 years, not 25, 10 years. 10 years for significant breakthroughs if stem cell research goes forward. Is that setting the bar too high? Um, no, I think that 10, ten years is, uh, when you're a researcher, you tend to look at long term, and I think 10 years with that respect is a legitimate time okay. frame. And what happens if they don't reach their goals in 10 years time? Uh, I, I don't know what happens, but yeah. the research is, you know, basic research is you have to spend time, energy, money, and maybe one day something coming out of it. And all the technologies that we are using right now, the cameras that you're using and everything else, is based on that trend. So we ha I guess it's fair to say uh, to continue that trend. Okay, let me ask you one thing that will sort of wrap up all of what we did last week at Q2C and then this interview as well. In our last 30 seconds, how can the non-scientific public participate in science? Um, they read, and I guess the, uh, the 
the media has a role to play, scientific community has a role to play, and definitely the uh, bigger chunk of responsibility, I would say, is on the shoulder of scientific community to bring public, uh, to engage them in scientific uh, research and discoveries. That's Mirdad Hariri. He is the chair of the 2009 Canadian Science Policy Conference, which starts in a couple of days in Toronto. We wish you well at the conference, and thank you for visiting us at TVO tonight. Thank you very much, Steve, for having me.